break just briefly after that. All right, thanks, Brother Lamar. And uh, let's see, did everybody get a, uh, a handout there? I had a handout I made. If you didn't, will you raise your hand? Um, and those guys that had the extras, if you could just grab those extra hands and we'll get those in the right spots. And uh, I don't know if you brought your Bible. If you did, we're going to just hang out in Isaiah chapter 6 for a little bit. And I'm going to try to adjust this a bit. Does this turn, Brother Lamar? It does turn, but it's very... Is it pretty cantankerous? That's okay. I can leave it as it is. It's yeah, totally fine. Up, the, up would be great. Up I can just force great. it. Oh, yep. okay. All right. All right. All right. That makes me feel extremely weak. Anyways, <laughs> Isaiah 6. And... Uh, Hey, uh, we've had a lot of sugar. Let's go ahead and sing something. You guys want to sing something? It's always fun when you got sugar in your throat. Let's do, uh, let's do holy, holy, holy in lieu of what we're doing. Let's just sing uh, the first verse. If you can hit a part, try it. Okay, here we go. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Well, we start in Isaiah 6, and I'll read the first four verses for us. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. I was in my personal devotions, and as any uh, Christian musician uh, has probably encountered, I bet the majority of you in this room have encountered this, uh, you've encountered someone complimenting uh, something that you've done uh, musically. Maybe if you're in the choir and somebody comes up to you after church and says, wow, that song was such a blessing. Thank you for that. Uh, and your response is generally going to be one of two things. One, it's going to be praise the Lord. That's a great response. Another response is going to be something like glory to God. Well, that's what we're talking about today. The right response to a compliment in music reflects a right theology of, of church music. So I remember uh, in my devotions, I started to think, well, all this talk about the word glory, what does it mean? Well, that's what we're going to look at today because I think it's where we can build a biblical music philosophy. And so let's have a word of prayer and we'll dive right in. Lord, thank you so much for the sufficiency of your scripture. Lord, thank you for the richness of music. Lord, as it is such an amazing way that we can glorify you, I pray that we would be, uh, I guess, faithful in our preparation. Lord, not just musically, but spiritually, because it's so important that we do that. Lord, that we would be uh, useful tools uh, in this wonderful work of church music. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I want to just give you uh, your first blank there in your, in your thing there. Um, and it's this, God's glory is the epicenter of church music. It's the, it's the baseline. It's where it all stems from. God's glory is the epicenter of church music. Now we're talking philosophy. We could rename that doctrine. We're going to look at the Bible and see what it has to say. So uh, we're going to, I guess, get a little technical today, but I think it's really important for us. So I'll try my best to not make it too, uh, I guess, scholastic, if you will, or academic. Um, but I want to make it uh, applicable for us where we can take the Bible, understand what glory means, understand what our job is, and then do it with joy in our hearts for the Lord. And so before we can get to the point of this, which is understanding a biblical music philosophy or doctrine, we have to define God's glory. But even before we get there, we have to go just a touch further back. Uh, and I think before we can define God's glory, we have to look at his holiness just a little bit. I'm going to explain why later, but for now, know that holiness of God and the glory of God go hand in hand. God's holiness and the way he's glorified, they go hand in hand. So we're going to look at two things. Uh, one, we're going to look at holiness, then we're going to look at glory, and then we're going to find biblical church music. So first is holiness. And as you're in Isaiah 6 and verse 3, and we just sang along with those seraphim, those angels, it says in Isaiah 6, 3, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
Well, if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, and I remember in Bible college, I asked the wrong question. In fact, several of us were doing this. Uh, anybody who's been at Bible college, you know some of those dorm room doctrinal talks? They can be fun. Uh, well, one of those talks was this question was, what is God's greatest attribute? Well, I think it's a good question. And a lot of people answered at that time, it's God's holiness. Now, I'm not going to say that's a bad answer, but I am going to say that it was the wrong question. What is God's greatest attribute? Well, if you really think about that, God's attributes are infinite. I think about uh, a, a little toy, you know, those wind up toys, like a toy soldier, and he's going to march after you wind him up. Well, if you put him just in front of a wall, what's going to happen? He's going to walk into it. He's going to bounce back and he's going to walk back into it. It's going to happen several times until, until he's done. Well, that's kind of what my mind does when I try to think of infinity. All right. It's like a it's like a circle. There is no end to infinity. There is no beginning. Well, this is the the. I guess the fact about God's attributes or what makes God God, God's holiness is infinite. There's no beginning. There's no end. It's totally filled up. But so is God's grace. So is God's love. So we were asking the wrong question. What is God's greatest attribute? You can't measure that. There's no way to identify that. I think the right question was this. What attribute defines God? What is God's defining attribute? And as we get a right understanding of what holiness is, then we can start understanding how we can classify this. Uh, and this is the, the, the truth of it is, uh, God's defining attribute is holiness. And this is why. What is holiness? I'm going to take an answer from the floor. When pastor says, holiness is, and we normally get two, two small words that describe holiness. Anybody want to take a stab at that? I'm not looking for a perfect answer, but we, we normally give a couple words for that. What is holy? Apart. Set apart. Yeah, that's exactly right. In other words, holiness is what sets something apart. So God's holiness is the, is the attribute that means he's different. Okay? Everything that is, he made. Uh, when he gave his name in the Old Testament to Moses, Moses says, how do I describe you? He says, I exist. I am. I, I, I am not like the rest. Now, we believe that God is transcendent, meaning God created, but he still has interaction. He has still revealed himself through his word, through his son, through his creation. So God is transcendent. He comes and he, he uh, interacts with us. But the fact of the matter is, there's something that I have in common with the trees outside, with the Puget Sound. I have something in common with Mount Rainier. I have something in common with every single one of you today. Even though we might have some weird things that we wrote down today, we all have one thing in common, and that is this. God made us. God made me. God made the tree. God made everything. It's something fundamental. My four-year-old son understands this already. God made everything, but there's something that none of us have in common with God. God never was created. God is set apart. God is holy. Now, a lot of times when we think of holiness, we think of a few different things. We think of righteousness. That definitely is an attribute of God's holiness. It's something that means God is set apart. He's, he's not like us. He is infinitely righteous. He is infinitely pure. We think of purity when we think of holiness. I pose today God's holiness, the attribute that means he is set apart, includes every attribute of God, his grace, his judgment, his wrath, his goodness, his peace. God is set apart and he is different. And that is what the seraphims were talking about in Isaiah 6. God is set apart. Holy, holy, holy. That is holiness. God is not like any other. He is infinitely holy. God's holiness is the trait of being set apart. God is holy because of his infinite attributes. God is, his infinite love sets him apart. God's infinite purity sets him apart. His righteousness, his wrath, and all the traits that make him up set him apart. God is holy, and included in that holiness are all of his attributes. These are the defining attribute, or holiness is the defining attribute of God. Now, we see something interesting, which is where it starts to connect to the point of the talk today. In, in verse 3, it says, One cried unto another. Here's what they're commenting on. This was their summary of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now they reference the earth. Now, why are the seraphims talking about the earth? They're talking about God. They're, 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 they're trying to describe God's nature. They're trying to give him worthiness. They're trying to give him praise. And, and they say, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy. Look at the earth. Well, what do they point to? You might expect them to say, the whole earth is full of his holiness. That's the subject matter. That's what they're talking about. They say it three times in a row. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth, look, it's full of God's glory. Well, that gives us a hint into our purpose of life as well as our purpose in church music. As we finish it, the whole earth is full of his, and let's finish it together, glory. glory. 
the whole earth is full of his glory. You might have expected something different, but that's what they said. When they summarized God, when they were worshiping God there in the throne room of God, and he's sitting high and lifted up, his chains filling the temple, they're flying around. This is an awesome moment. And they say, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy. Look at the earth. It shows off his glory. Look at the earth. It shows off his glory. Imagine with me, we're in a great auditorium. Anybody been to like the Seattle Symphony in Benaroya Hall? Uh, some of you. Anyways, if you're in a big auditorium, let's suppose you found your seat and the whole place is full of people. And they dim all of the lights. Except for on the stage, there are three easels that are covered with black veils. And there's a spotlight on each easel. The mystery starts to overcome. You're sitting there and you're thinking, what is behind the veil? Then all of a sudden, as the show starts, out walks the narrator, the narrator and he says, ladies and gentlemen, the glory of God. And at that moment, when he says the glory of God, all three veils drop. And you notice painted on easels is holy, holy, holy. The act of revealing God's holiness, of revealing his grace. This is giving glory to God. It's lifting him up for who he truly is. Well, imagine that. That is our job. All right. A biblical music philosophy. Here it is. It's to glorify God. Great job singing today, Brother Lamar. Glory to God. I hope it revealed something about him. I hope when we sing grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. I hope it put a spotlight, not on me. I hope it took the veil off of anybody's understanding. I hope it exposed for what it truly was, the grace of our benevolent father. That is giving glory to God. It's a shame when we receive glory. And that's why we've, we've ingrained it into our music philosophies. Look, when somebody gives you a compliment, deflect. Okay, it's not you. Your velvety tones, praise the Lord, you can sing. Praise the Lord, you can play the piano like that. God wanted you to use that talent not to glorify, not to reveal your greatness. God gave you that so that you could shed light on who he is. To glorify your father, which is in heaven. Well, I want to give us a few statements and they're written in your notes. The first statement is this. God's glory is the revealing of his holiness. It is the act of God's holiness being manifested. Let's talk about uh, the word itself, glory, and we're going to define it. We're going to look at a couple words. The first is the Hebrew word. So whenever you find glory in the Old Testament, you've got this Hebrew word kavod, and it helps us understand a little bit of our job as musicians, but not just musicians, as anything that has been created. It's our job to glorify God. Well, if we understand what it means, I think it's really important. The word is kavod. It means to be heavy, to be weighty, to be grievous. Hard, rich, honorable, glorious, to be burdensome or to be honored. It's kind of like a word picture because if you know anything about Hebrew, a lot of their words are really word pictures to help us understand or comprehend. And so the word picture is something like this. One who is glorified is given by the uh, one who is perceiving them a great weight. When, when the pastor walks into the room, it feels just a little different. Whether he likes that or not, he's, he's your authority. God has set him up as the pastor of the church. And when your pastor walks in, you don't glorify him because of who he is. You glorify, in a sense, you give him weight or you give him worth because of the position that God placed him in. You give him a little bit extra weight into your life. When we glorify God, we're saying, look, God is worthy of respect of fear, of awe, of, of, of all of the honor we can bestow upon him. That is what the, the sense of the Hebrew word. Now let's move into the New Testament. And when we read the word glory in the New Testament, does anybody want to give a, a shot at that? Because there's a, it's, it's a little more popular. Anybody want to try a shot at the, at the Greek word for glory? Doxa, doxa glory, doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Okay, that's doxa. It's talking about the glory of God. Started that pretty high. We should all sing it right there just to wake you up. Sorry, my choir gets mad at me. I, I'm a tenor and uh, I don't like singing low. Um, anyways, sorry. <clears throat> the word is doxa. It means opinion, judgment, or view. So the Greek carries a different sense of the same idea. It means to be informed about and then to develop a great opinion on a subject or on the subject. In other words, it's to be informed about God's nature, who he is, what he's done, the, the attributes of God, to be informed of that, but not just to be educated. A lot of people know a lot about God in here, but they do not glorify God. Or God is not necessarily glorified to them just because they understand what a Bible verse says. But this idea of doxa is to be informed and then to put great honor or weight 
to what you have just learned. It's, it's possible to understand something, but not to really give it any credibility. Well, the word doxa is not that kind of word. It's not just to be informed. It's to glorify or to lift up the thing that you have just learned. The Greek carries that sense there. Often doxa is used in relation to splendor, to brightness, to light, representing the nature of God's holiness and also highlighting the act of exposing the holiness of God like a light exposes what is in the darkness. Uh, So to help us understand it, here's a modern way we use the word glory. Uh, Maybe you guys are familiar with this. Uh, Do we have any dog lovers here today? Any dog lovers? I'm a dog lover. I love me some dogs. The dog that I grew up with, his name was Bubba, and uh, he was a basset hound. He's those, he one of those short ones that are really ugly, and they're always cranky, which is the best part about him. Because when you've had a bad day, you can walk up to the dog, and you can look at him and say, you know what? I don't have it that bad. Praise the Lord for that. You know, he's always worse off than you are. So anyways, Bubba, uh, if I were to tell you just about any story of Bubba, it's a negative story. He was not a good-mannered dog. Okay, now let's suppose I was telling you about my dog, Bubba, and uh, I would say, look, I got home the other day and the door was open. I was scared to death until I looked at the floor and there were muddy paw prints all over the floor. I knew what was going on. There was no burglar. It was Bubba. He walked into the, fl- into the door and-, and he's tracking mud all over my floor. And as I followed the trail of paw prints, also I saw some shredded paper. I started noticing it got a- this little trail of paper. Well, I walked around and I looked inside the living room and there he was in all his glory. Have you ever used the word glory like that? There he was in all his glory. It's a sarcastic use of the word to say everything about him was apparent at that moment. I, I, he might put on a good show when, when, you, when you meet him for the first time. Oh, this is Bubba. And everyone, oh, so cute, Bubba. Come here and just start, you know, baby talk because I don't know, we do that when we meet dogs. And so you, you, you meet Bubba and you think, what a great dog. I would say, no, 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 no. He has not been exposed to you just yet. You don't know his true nature. You don't know the attribute of Bubba that he destroys things. He ruins carpet. He ate my favorite book. Bubba is not what you think he is. Let me expose him for what he truly is. And there he was in all his glory. That's a sarcastic use of it. But the same, I guess, sense of that is the way we are to be as those who would expose God for who he truly is. One day we will behold him in all of his glory. We will see him as he is. We call this the doctrine of glorification. What an amazing thing. I am going to become different. I'm going to understand, but I'm going to see God for who he truly is. This is glory. We call heaven glory because that's where God is. So this is the glory of God. It's the revealing of his holiness. Let's see that in action. And I'll read you a verse. I think you have it there. Romans 15, 9 says this. And that the Gentiles might glorify God. Well, how are they going to do it? For his mercy. There you go. You've got glorifying God is to shed light on his attributes. Glorify God for his mercy. So that is one aspect of the next blank you have there. God's glory is something you can experience. Something you experience. Uh, It's a whole chapter, so we're not going to necessarily go there. But do you guys remember when Moses asked God the question? He had no idea what he was talking about. And he said in Exodus 33, God, show me your glory. How did God respond? He didn't say, I'll show you my glory. He defined what God's glory was. He says, you can't handle looking at me. That's That's what glory is. He says, show me your glory. He says, to show you my glory is to show you me. And if I showed you me, you'd die. You cannot handle that. No man has seen God at any time. When he said, God, show me your glory, what a request it was, but he had no idea what he was asking for. So God hit him in the cleft of the rock. Remember this? And remember God turned around and he says, I'm going to pass by. You'll see my hinder parts. And what happened after that? Moses was glowing, literally physically glowing, because he beheld in a new way. The, uh, the, the glory or the revealing of God in his life, it's something that we can experience. Has, have you ever experienced the glory of God? If you were in church today, you experienced it this morning as pastor opened up the Bible and we saw something about God. I don't know what he preached on, but he took the Bible and he showed you God. A, maybe a portion of it, maybe just a little piece of it. Maybe he just gave you a challenge from the word of God. And, and maybe it wasn't all of the Bible. We can't, we can't comprehend infinite mercy. But maybe he lifted it up just a little bit and said, look, look here. Here's God's mercy. Here's God's grace. 
That is to glorify God, and it's something that we can experience, and it's something we ought to experience on a daily basis. I glorified God, or God was glorified to me in Psalm 119 this morning as I was studying my Bible. That's how God glorifies himself to you. But get this, on the next point, glory is something we can promote. All creation exists to glorify God. As I came around the bend on, on 405 today, Brother Lamar, boy, the mountain was out. What a beautiful sight. You know what that mountain is there for? It's to tell me something about God. It's to show me that he is. It's to show me his might, his beauty, his majesty. When you go out into the woods, I love this. I was with a pastor friend recently, or actually it's been a couple years now. We hiked up Mount Pilchuck. And how cool was it when he got up there and he was so overwhelmed, he didn't care what I thought or any of the by pastors thought. He just said, God, you're awesome, because he is. That's what that existence is. That's what creation does. It's there to glorify God and show him off. It's something that I can experience and it's something that I can promote. What an amazing fact that that is, that the heavens declare the glory of God. All creation exists to glorify God. But get this, all humanity specifically specifically exists to glorify God. Isaiah 43, 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have created him for my glory. All right, I want you to, to yourself, say, God created me for his glory. Can we say that together? God created me for his glory. Say it one more time. God created me for his glory. That's your job. I, I don't know what you do as a trade, but the first and foremost, Brother Lamar, I'm not a pastor. First and foremost, it's not that I'm a music director or, or a, a Sunday school teacher. First and foremost, it's not that I'm a husband or a father. First and foremost, it's not that I'm a son. First and foremost, my job is to lift him up, to point to him, to reveal him in all of his glory. That's my job, and it's something that we get to do. Well, as we come to a near close, another point here, God's glory is something that we can attempt to steal. And this is where I think it's important to have a robust music philosophy in your church. And I think that's revealed through the decades of, of how consistent your music has been. And praise the Lord for that. But let's not let the, the success of the past uh, be forgotten. And let's remember that it's our responsibility to uphold the doctrine of God's music. And it's this, that God wants us to glorify him and his glory is something that we can steal. Uh, the, the reason I say attempt to steal is because every heist of God's glory has an interesting effect on glory. Okay, what do I mean by that? Maybe I can illustrate just a little bit. Uh, you guys know the, the old fable about Midas and how he got one wish, and Midas said, my wish is that everything I touch phew, would turn into gold. Well, in guitar world, because I'm a guitarist, uh, in the guitar world, they have what they call the opposite Midas touch. I don't know, it's not very catchy, but that's what they say. It's the opposite Midas touch. Well, what is that? It means that when you touch the golden strings, if you've got sweaty hands, sorry, that, that's another weird thing about me. I got sweaty hands. And when you touch those golden strings, it's like that Christmas just goes straight away because the acid on your hands starts to wear down the coating on the string and you start to get a duller sound on the strings. Well, that's the opposite. And that's really what happens when we touch God's glory. It gets this opposite Midas touch. When I try to take God's glory for myself, when I sing a solo and somebody says, Brother Keith, you are amazing. And I say, hmm. Thank you. I've touched it. I, I've tried to take it in for myself, but it, it always goes sour. There's never been one time in my life where I tried to receive glory that it did not transition into the opposite of glory. And do you know what the opposite of glory is? It's shame. Look in, in the Bible here in Psalm 4 and verse 2. Oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? It's the opposite. How long will you love vanity? Seek after leasing. Selah. Think about it. That's a musical term. Son of man, when you touch the glory of God, you, when you're singing about God's goodness, but you want everybody to think you're good, you've turned that glory into shame. What a pity. How terrible that is. You see, when I really revealed my dog in all of his glory, really, I was revealing his shame. When I reveal something that is not pleasant, that is not right, and it is not right. It is not right when I try to take the glory of God for myself. This is biblical music philosophy. You can be a great piano player. You can be a great choir singer. You can be the best tenor in the tenor section. But if you do not reflect the glory to God, you are a terrible church musician. I'm sorry. You might be a great musician, but that's not what we're looking for. God wants worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And praise the Lord that we can be that. 
And the cool thing about it, you don't have to be the best one in the world. I've got people in my choir. Uh, now, some of you choir members, I don't know about Brother Lamar. Uh, my choir members are suspicious that I put people in certain spots in the choir uh, for particular reasons. Now, they think that it's because of musical ability, and I'll admit, uh, I wouldn't tell them this, but sometimes it is, all right? I do have that guy that only sings forte, and I put him as far away from the microphone as possible, okay? He's a great brother, okay? But you know what I try to do? I found the best smile. We've got like a 15-year-old girl who's got the best smile in the whole choir. You know where I put her? Right on the front row. You know why? Because she glorifies God. It's tough. It's, I mean, it's really tough. This morning we sang a song, Blessed Trinity. It's a new choir song, and it kind of brings in elements of holy, holy, holy. And the first line of the song is awesome. It says, holiness greater than we comprehend. What a line. Holiness greater than we comprehend. That lifts up God. Some of the people in the choir, holiness greater than... Does that glorify God? No. No. Now their heart, their heart might be right, but we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we're not misrepresenting God's glory, and we attempt to steal that at times. When we glorify ourselves, it is shameful. Well, now we get to our last point today, the philosophy of church music, and we've alluded to it quite a bit. Uh, I want to give you your, your blanks here, and then we'll be finished. It's this, church music was initiated by God for his glory. Uh, we've actually, you've got some verses on your table there, and I noticed on our table here is, is the verse that I'm gonna, getting ready to read. So I thought maybe it'd be fun. Brother Lamar, since you're the choir director, can you read that verse right there for us? I know you love that verse. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here it is. Teaching and admonishing. Praise the Lord, we have the ability to understand who God is. It says this. Now, here's, here's your job. Choir, choir member, piano player, whatever else role that you play in the music ministry, it's this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, we all stumble. We all fail. I want to encourage you, especially on a Sunday morning before you get up and minister, to at least fill yourself a little bit with the word of Christ. To, to let God speak to you himself. Think about the, even the message of the song. If you're singing holiness greater than we comprehend, amen? Well, Isaiah 6 might be a good prep for that. You see, you want God to be glorified to you. You cannot deflect what has not come to you. And he says, first, in church music, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be full of it. Fill yourself up. Allow God to speak to you personally. And then he says, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Here's what I like to pray before I sing, before I play, before I lead. It's this. God, be glorified to me. And God, be glorified through me. Be glorified to me. Let me understand what it is that I'm doing. Show me who you are. The same thing that Moses says, God, show me your glory. Lord, show me your glory. And then God help me to reflect that to the rest of the world. That is our job. I want to give you a few points to finish up here. Before you can glorify God to others, he has to be glorified to you first. That's a principle. Uh, any of you in school remember when the teacher would make you write sentences on the board? If you've done something bad, okay, Keith is a bad kid. Keith is a bad kid. And you have to write it a hundred times or something like that. Do you guys remember that? You know why they do that? Because they want you to really, really, really remember it. This wouldn't be a bad sentence if you really just struggle with memory to just write down a few times. Before I can glorify God to somebody else, I have to understand who he is first. He must be glorified to me first. Fill yourself up with him. Get to know him. Have a, a real relationship, a walk with God before you're going to feed others. Remember in the airplane and they always give you that spiel before? They say, if the oxygen masks come down, you put one on yourself and then you can help somebody else. I used to think, how selfish. I want to be the hero. I want to just get after and start putting masks on everybody else. And they're going to say, my hero. Well, if I'm dead, I'm not going to do a good job with that, am I? I've got to put the, the oxygen on my face so that I can survive to help somebody else. If I don't, I'm not going to be very useful. And I'm not going to be a very useful church musician if I have not been nourished by the word of God. I cannot nourish somebody else with the word of God. Pastor knows this, Brother Lamar knows this, anybody who's ever taught a Sunday school lesson knows this. It's pretty tough to pour out when you never got poured into. An empty cup does not 
pour anything out of it. Be filled first, and then you can pour out into others. Another principle, church music, by biblical nef- definition, is a teaching ministry. What is teaching? We're teaching about God. We're revealing who he is. We're putting the spotlight on him. So this is really, I think, uh, the, the foundation of church music. I'm not going to talk to you too much today. Uh, this is something for your pastor and your, your music pastor to identify, okay, some specifics of how we do that. Uh, your dress code and some of the things that he mentioned. But I just want to encourage you today, your job as a human, as something created, but especially as a musician, is to unveil God's nature and to show it off for the rest of the world to see. Thank you, Brother Mark. Thank you.